So season two, we, we've heard it reinvents itself a little. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing that? Uh, that was sort of always the, the concept of the show. We said season one was going to take place in the Arctic at this base, and we were going to sort of close that story to a large extent, destroy the base at the end, and, and not go back to that location. So that every the idea was every season of the show would be in a different place. We would maintain the uh, one day per episode structure, move the, the, the mythology forward, and, and you know, continue to uh, revisit some of the cast and, and characters, but that visually it would look different, you'd have a different color palette for each season, and we would move the show to a different location location, uh, put it, uh, you know, make it a claustrophobic story that takes place over here this season and then over there next season. Sometimes play with, uh, you know, time, how long has elapsed between the seasons. Sometimes they could be, you know, right up against each other. Sometimes they could be a longer span. Because when we pitched the concept, we, we sort of said up front, look, we don't want it to just be this one particular virus and this one thing because we didn't want to just repeat the show so it's kind of a riskier move because you are changing up things that uh, the audience grew to love and to enjoy the first season but that's the road we're going to take and so second season was a very different thing how far down have you got it planned uh well we have outlines through the, about half of them you know detailed outlines and but we have uh basically in story structure and what the long arcs are of pretty much you know, the year when we talked to you last year, you guys all seemed at least semi-certain that, that pretty much everybody was going to be dead by the end of the first season. Um, when did you decide to not uh, not kill everyone off? <laughs> uh, pretty early. You know, I mean, I think that was... It, it's tough to do a show if you're going to literally kill them all <laughs> and recast every year. So I think we sort of recognized, well, we're, we're probably going to keep most of them, you know, and, and, yeah. around, and we would lose a few along the way. Yeah. Were there any challenges to the show that were unique to some of the shows you've done in the past? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a much more technological show. It's a horror show, uh, neither uh, one of which is my strong suit, which is why, you know, initially I didn't, I wasn't even really interested in, in doing the show until I read the script and was sort of taken with the characters and the way it was structured and, and the, the sort of the way it was grounded in, in, in something real. And that continues to sort of be a challenge because they're not, neither one of those is my strong suit. It's like I can appreciate them, you know, not as well as Steve does because Steve is really conversant in them, really loves that kind of material, and I sort of uh, try to help out with character and sort of plot and sort of structure you know, overall and leave the sort of nitty gritty of well how does A lose to B you know and, and that stuff and the, and the shock moments and you know, what's what's a horrific you know uh, death you know rap scene in people's faces and stuff it's, I'm not the one that'll pitch that idea but it's like oh well that's great you know? how does the complexity open up when you move it from a really isolated place to a more populated more complex, not so isolated. Well, the trick is still to try to, uh, even within in a more populated uh, place, to still isolate our story, to keep it contained, because I think the claustrophobic element of the show is one of the hallmarks of what Helix is. So wherever you're going, you're working to sort of keep the, this, uh, this crucible on our characters and the time pressure that it's all happening right here. Does the tone change at all? Are we uh, the tone will be, uh, you know, the tone will probably vary because we, because we have shifted where it is and what the storyline is. Uh, but there's still going to be this sort of idea of uh, horrific things that happen based on you know, you know the, the virus or a different virus or viruses or. You know, um, but that'll kind of be similar. We'll try to keep the, the dark sense of humor going through the show. So fundamentally, yes, the, the tone will be similar, but it'll kind of change just by the nature of going someplace else and visually you know, doing something different. Speaking of the dark sense of the humor, uh, I wonder if you could talk about the music on the show. Yeah, I mean, that was great. Uh, we set the tone in that very first episode with the first scene, you know, going into uh, going into the, uh, the aftermath of, of all the deaths and the guys walking down the hall and playing Do You Know the Way to San Jose. And it was just a, it was something we came up with, with in the editing room. It wasn't in the script, and it was just an interesting way to, to open the show, and it felt like it said something, you know, disturbing to the audience and yet could make them smile and, and yet feel weird that they were smiling during this whole sequence so it, it was keeping people off balance and then once we realized that was working it became okay let's keep doing that because there's something great about not letting the audience get comfortable either in the horror or in the humor and kind of trying to ride the line between the two of them. What's your opinion of these shortened seasons, the 10, the 12, the 13 episodes rather than the long run? I think they're better. I think you can do better work, you know, uh, frankly. I think when you get up into the 20s, it's a, it, the marathon becomes backbreaking in a lot of ways. It, the writer's room gets exhausted. The cast and crew get exhausted. 
you know, somewhere around episode 18, you're just trying to make it to the end. You know, it's just really, you know, at Star Trek, we did 26, which was just, I can't imagine doing that, that again. And when you're doing a shorter order of 13, you can just spend more time. You can kind of concentrate on each one. And I just think the quality of the show overall is, is higher on the, on the shorter orders. You don't lose any of the story that you wanted to tell by having a short season? That's, I mean, it hasn't been my experience. There might be stories in which that's, that's true, but uh, generally, if you're going longer, you're, you're trying to stretch a story out to that many hours. And for whatever reason, 13, 10 to 13 hours has become a good you know, length for, for a television season. What about this cast? I mean, I love Billy Campbell. I'm a huge fan of his, and having him as one of the leads is fantastic. How did you know he was right? Uh, just had known his work for a long time. You know, his his name was on you know, towards the top of the list for that character because I think we'd all. I think uh, people in sci-fi had worked with him on other. Pro- I'm trying to remember what he had done specifically for sci-fi. I just can't remember. But they knew him well and liked him and. Uh, I'd known his work for a long time, and he had, I don't think I'd actually cast him in anything on previous shows, but his name kept was always sort of in the mix for different roles, and sometimes he wasn't available or whatever. So, you know, Billy Campbell's just you know, he's a, a really good TV actor, and so he, his name tends to come up in these kind of discussions. So what about the scare factor? How important is it for, for in this show in particular to have the audience scared and freaked out? How much emphasis is going to be put on that? I think that's important. I, I don't think it's uh, it's not everything. You know, I think there's uh, the characters are everything. You have to invest in these people and invest in them. You know, in their particular individual stories, and then be taken off guard on these these sort of shocker moments. You know, I think if 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 the show is too upfront about okay, we're just going to keep scaring you, you'll just stop being scared like rather quickly. But if you kind of get used to something, you're starting to pay attention to this thing over here, and then something bites you over here, then it's much more effective. Speaking of which, which is your favorite character? Uh, Never, yeah. This is how to get in trouble with your cast. Can you tell us anything about new characters that we'll be showing out? We do have a new character uh, who's uh, an, uh, is a, is a man, uh, and he's a member of the uh, CDC that, that joins the team, essentially. But we haven't cast him yet, so it's still early. Any ideal casting that you'd want for him? We do have some names. <laughs> we have some names. We have some thoughts. <laughs> and those would be? Those would be <laughs> not, a, not here. <laughs> what does it rhyme with? <laughs> yeah. How do you count for this interest, and you guys are kind of at the beginning of it, in viruses? Is this kind of like a new nuclear war terror? It might be. You know, I think it's something that just, it just chills you as soon as you start thinking and talking about it. It's it, similar to, yeah, the way radiation used to be. It's the invisible threat that could be all around you that, you know, can kill you without knowing. I think that just fundamentally frightens people. I think it's more scary because it just, wasn't it a week ago, two weeks ago, that there was a report that... Was it France that lost track of like just a whole oh, yeah. pile of viruses that they just, well, we we misplaced them? Well, so it makes some, your show that much more credible when things like that. Yeah, you know, happen. there's still there was something with uh, wasn't there something recently about the smallpox vaccine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The renewed Ebola uh, that's not stopping. Yeah, I mean these are real things and they're scary things. So you know when you're doing a show that deals with that, you are sort of touching a nerve that really does frighten people. You don't have to work quite as hard to convince them that it exists. Like a, you know, there's tons of vampire stories, but you do have to sort of get the audience to buy into that concept, um, and it doesn't really chill people the way viruses do. Less suspension, exactly. Way less these days. Way less, yeah, exactly. And freak out everyone who's afraid of touching things without. Oh yeah, their there's hand. plenty. There's plenty of that in society. So. Do you ever feel like hair spread too thin? You've got so many projects in the works. Sometimes I try, you know, I mean, I'm not the, the, the day-to-day showrunner on Helix. You know, Steve is really the guy. He's, he's there day-to-day. He's in the writer's room, editing. You know, he's really the man. And I try to just help out. I supervise a little bit and, you know, give notes or uh, talk to them, meet with the writers periodically and just give them my thoughts. But, you know, the lion's share of my, my time is spent on Outlander at this point. Um, how is it that, I mean, how does it feel that fans come to shows because your name is attached to them? That's a lot of weight on your um, shoulder too, though, isn't it? To deliver a product. Yeah, it's odd. You know, I'm not. It's it's 
it didn't used to be that way. It didn't used to be the showrunners in TV mattered or were known by anybody, and except for those of us in the business who kind of knew who Stephen Bochco was and you know, that kind of thing. But it wasn't it didn't market shows based on that. So it's interesting that suddenly that's how these shows are marketed, and somehow my name brings people in for whatever reason. And it's it's nice, it's flattering, and yeah, but it still at the same time you feel this sort of okay, but better deliver because they will blame you for it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, remembering a yeah, good and a bad. <laughs> Can you talk about the influence of social media over the course of your career has obviously changed, and, and how does that interaction with the fans affect the story or the trajectory of the show? Uh, I always try to keep it at arm's length in terms of how it affects story. Uh, when I started interacting with fans online back at Star Trek, back in the old days, you know, when the internet was just a baby. It was very small, and it was just, you know, I had a Q&A board on AOL. I did that for, for a while. Uh, when I went to Battlestar, then it was a blog, and then the podcasts, which I didn't even know what a podcast was when I did the first one. And that was all kind of fun, and I enjoyed it, and I liked the fan interaction. And then it became an explosion of social media that I just can't even keep up with anymore. You know, I, I tweet, you know, really randomly, you know, periodically, and it's it's too much now to try to track. There's so many outlets of how you can touch into fans. It's useful. Uh, I think some people really like it. There's definitely showrunners who use it almost daily. And I've kind of pulled back from it because it's just too distracting. I can barely keep up with my email, much less you know, anything else at this point. I have a weird question. Okay, so your shows, you thought of them as candy flavors. What flavor would Helix be? <laughs> um, what flavor would Helix be? Something really tart. I'm not sure. Maybe licorice? <laughs> Maybe licorice, yeah. Something expired. Something <laughs> expired. <laughs> well, so you could take licorice whips and make them into a DNA. Story. Yeah, well, there you go. I should write that down. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we expect um, based off of what you're developing for season two? What can we expect to see and what are we going to be shocked with? You'll see a different story structure uh, other than the fact that we're keeping you know the one-day episode the format. But we are telling the narrative and the way we're, we're delineating different storylines will be a little bit surprising compared to season one. Uh, some characters will return, other characters will return later, other characters won't return, so we're trying to keep a, you know, keep a kind of an interesting mix going of, of what your expectation is and who you think is going to be in the show and who then turns out to be in the show. Uh, like I said, the, the look is going to be different. We're set in a different location. Uh, this one is a, uh, this is an island. You know, this is not going to be the, the Arctic the Arctic anymore. So the visual palette is very different. Um, it's just going to have a lot of change up pitches, and you know, hopefully they all land. We're going to an island. An island. Retract that. <laughs> <laughs> What was your reaction to uh, Doreen having to die? Well, you know, that's an interesting story because at the beginning we just said, okay, Doreen's going to die here, and it was always planned, and then we sort of went, oh, shit, she was really great, <laughs> and she was fun, really and we, but by the time we realized she was really great and how much we enjoyed her, she would basically was dead. <laughs> it was just no turning back, so I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> If we had to take that one back, we probably would. <laughs> but we've heard characters don't really necessarily die and stay dead. What is TV? Right. <laughs> yes. There's always a way out. So, so there's a possibility she may show up. Uh, anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a weird strain that turns her into a zombie or something. <laughs> Maybe a twin sister, Maureen. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, laughs> Maureen. Keep going. Time travel. <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots they of no. DNA. Yeah, yeah <laughs> keep it as a sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Right. Thank, Thank you so much.